Good morning, Year 10. Welcome back to another week. Hopefully you all enjoyed some of that lovely sunshine last week. Um, this week's lesson is on vocabulary and it should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, however, I will talk you through the PowerPoint um, and just point out anything that might be unclear. There will need to be um, lots of opportunities for you to pause, go away, do the work and then come back and listen to the next part of the PowerPoint. So do be ready for that. Okay, right, so do now, um, before we do anything else, is there are some words here, some that you will be familiar with, some you won't. And I want you to write down the words, it can be on a piece of paper or on a Word document, and try and write a definition. If you're really struggling with that, you might try want to try and write a sentence with the word in. And a challenge for you is to look up any words you're unfamiliar with. Hopefully, you've all got a dictionary to hand, but if you haven't, you can just use Google. So I will read through these words now, and then after I have read through them, I would suggest you pause the video, go away, do the work, and then we will obviously go through them. So the first one here where you can see my mouse, melancholy, idyllic, hideous, solemn, formidable, depraved, frail, sadistic, amiable, tranquil, benevolent, and lavish. Okay, so if you just pause now and get on with that task. Okay, so hopefully you've all done that now, and let's see what I'm not sure how many of these you managed to get right, but I will just read um, a short definition for each one. So melancholy is depressing, sullen, intense sadness. Idyllic is almost like a, a paradise. So you could use that to describe a place. Hideous, something that's ugly or horrid to look at. If um, someone is solemn, they might be formal and dignified. Whereas if they're formidable, they might be large and powerful um, and they might create a, um, some sort of fear in people because they're so formidable. To be depraved is cruel, wicked or evil. To be frail is weak and delicate. Um, we usually think of that as something that would be quite easy to break, something we need to treat quite carefully. Um, to be sadistic is um, someone who gains pleasure from inflicting pain. Um, I'm sure I could describe lots of you as amiable, which means you are friendly and pleasant. And the next one, tranquil. Unfortunately, there's not much of this going on in my house at the moment. Tranquil means peace and calm. Um, Benevolent, well-meaning and kind. I'm sure that's um, a word that comes from Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. First time we ever heard that word. Don't check me up on that one. And finally, lavish. So if we were describing something as lavish, it would be rich, luxurious and elaborate. OK, so why have I just given you... 4, 8, 12, bit of maths there for you. Why have I given you 12 random words and asked you to find out the definitions? Well, um, as you know, you have been working on question one, paper five, but what we're doing today will also be vitally important when it comes to question five on paper two, and it is the use of vocabulary in your own writing. Um, and I find that this is a great way of trying, helping you sort of climb up that mark scheme and get into those higher bands. So this is what it says on the actual mark scheme. In order to have grade eight or grade nine vocabulary, it will be extensive and ambitious. Grade seven, you just use one of those words, so extensive. And around the grade four to five mark, you are choosing vocabulary for effect. OK, so do you actually understand the meaning of those words? Right. So if you are being asked to use ambitious vocabulary, ambition is having or showing a strong desire and determination to succeed. So to put that in layman's terms, it means using words that show you 
uh, show that you are pushing your writing to be successful um, and when you mark a piece of writing that has ambitious vocabulary it is often um, quite obvious extensive so what does that word extensive mean around the grade seven mark that means in a large amount or scale so that means that you're using a wide range of those interesting words you know it's not enough to use one or two big words and think that you're going to be getting around that grade seven mark it needs to be extensive there needs to be lots of them apologies we've just got year 10 walking past the corridor if, if you can hear them you might even hear yourself how strange um, and the last one, effect, is a change which is a result or consequence of an action or cause. So what does that mean for vocabulary? It means choosing words that are designed to make the reader think or feel something specific. And again, when you read those stories, you think, what a well thought out or well chosen word. You know, that really makes me feel sympathy for that character. Um, and that's what you need to be aiming for at that grade four to five mark. Okay, what you don't want to do is shown in this video here, um, which I'm going to get up on YouTube now and show you, which is quite strange as obviously you can do that yourself, but I will include it as part of the video. So, Okay, I'm not actually sure if the YouTube video will, will show up. So I am going to ask you to go and watch that yourselves. Now, obviously, you're not as old as me, but hopefully due to the invention of the wonder that is Netflix, I'm sure some of you have seen Friends um, and Joey, you know, what a character. But what we don't want is we don't want you to be using vocabulary in the way that Joey does in that letter because let's be honest it doesn't make any sense and you know if, if all you do is you, you know you get a thesaurus and try and add all those words in they need to make sense so that's what we're going to talk about today uh, how to avoid that and how to be successful um, in your writing okay so choosing words for effect this obviously as i said is the grade four to grade five criteria Okay, so choosing words for effects. So the chipped worktop was covered with discarded items of clothing and the remnants of that morning's breakfast. Okay, so those words that are in bold there, chipped, discarded and remnants, what do these three words help you to understand about this character's house? I want you to have a little think about that. I'll go through them all and then we'll go through the answers. The next one, there are several pin boards haphazardly displayed around the room, breaking up the clinical brightness. So again, how do those highlighted words make you feel about that room? Is it somewhere you'd like to be? Do you think you'd be comfortable in that room? Narrowing his snake-like eyes, he shot a look of venom at his new classmates. So again, how do those highlighted words make the boy sound? So I'd like you to pause the video now and have a go at um, answering those questions in purple. Okay, hopefully you've all had a go at that. So let's look at the first one, chipped, discarded and remnants. Right, those three words there, tell us that this character's house isn't very well um, cared for. It might be a description you remember from a previous lesson. Another example was where they talked about the yellowing wallpaper. So it's this idea that it, it's not very well cared for the house. Um, and that's when you choose words for effect. Those words are showing you that. Um, the next one, haphazardly and clinical. Um, how do they make you feel about the room? Well, for me, it's certainly not somewhere I'd want to go and relax yet. Yeah? Not only is it slightly unorganised with things uh, haphazardly all over, that clinical brightness suggests it's quite uncomfortable. It suggests it's quite a sterile um, environment. You know, the sort of lighting that might give you a headache, perhaps. And the final one, narrowing shot and venom. Don't know if you noticed there there almost seems to be a bit of a pattern pattern with some of those um words how do they make him sound well certainly not kind so they make the the boy sound quite um quite sinister possibly quite violent you could say 
Um, so hopefully you got something similar. It doesn't need to be the exact same answers, but that's just showing you how you can choose words for effects. So your challenge now, you, you've seen it done there, but this time you're going to change the words that are underlined um, for the words for the stated effect in purple. Let me explain. So the first one, the little boy looked up with his normal expression to meet the man's eyes. Right, you need to change those words that I've underlined to show um, terror. So you need to create a feeling of terror. Okay, so I'll go through them and then again we can pause it. The old house sat alone at the top of the high hill. I want you to try and make that sound eerie, so slightly creepy. And then finally, the drivers pressed their horns. People walked from one side of the road to the other. I want you to change that to frantic. So just to give you an example of how um, you might change one of these. Let's just have a look at number three because that's the last one I've just read. So if we were trying to make it sound frantic, instead of saying people walked from one side of the road to the other, you might use a word like dashed or hurried. Okay, that word would um, help create that effect of that frantic um, mood. Okay, so pause it and then um, have a go at actually doing that yourself. Okay, so what did you manage to come up with? There's lots of options and these are by no means the right ones. These are just um, some for you to consider. So maybe the little boy, to make him sound a little bit more vulnerable, could become the tiny boy. And instead of him looking up, perhaps he could glance up to show his nerves and, um, and that fear that he's feeling. Instead of saying he has a normal expression, Perhaps you could describe it as terrified. And instead of saying the man's eyes, let's call him a stranger, which might explain the little boy's terror. So that sentence there becomes the tiny boy glanced up with his terrified expression to meet the stranger's eyes. OK, um, number two. So the old house sat alone at the top of the high hill. Perhaps we could have the decrepit house sat isolated at the top of the highest hill perhaps and lots of choices you can do for that one i'm sure you probably could, um, have managed to come up with something better we already discussed number three but instead of the drivers pressing their horns you know maybe they thump their horns or um the drivers hit their horns something to try and create that frantic feel Okay, right, we're going to move on now to try and work towards more using the extensive and ambitious vocabulary that we talked about. Below is a fantastic example um, written by a, a student. And I would argue that it uses both extensive and ambitious vocabulary um, and the exam board agreed. So what I would like you to do, everyone is going to highlight it where you can see that extensive and ambitious vocabulary. That's your bronze option. So everyone needs to do that. If you need to, use a dictionary or Google to find out the definitions of any of those words that you don't understand. And then if you want to challenge yourself, which I really do urge you to do, can you try and write your own sentences using some of these words? These words will only become familiar to you if you practice using them. So I really do urge you um, to be doing that with, with the new words that you're being introduced to. OK, so I will read through it and then I will ask you to pause. A myriad of aromas gently lingered in the air that was thick with heat, which only further amplified the enticing nature of the foods. The quaint market, which was situated in the tight alleyways of the village, was alive with a bustling atmosphere and more than compensated for its tedious size. The stalls displayed numerous food, peppers, melons, grapes, lemons, fish, beef, lamb, tomatoes, as if they were the most cherished prizes. The sea of colours illuminated the scene, swirling into a vibrant kaleidoscope to passers-by.
which only attracted and enticed the customers more. Okay, so now pause and work your way through those um, challenges. And when you've done that, come back to the video. Okay, so developing your ambitious vocabulary. This is a bit of a plea really from me. Um, I cannot stress enough that, you know, your classroom teachers can teach you some words and get you to learn them and, um, you know, get you to use them in your own writing. But really developing a good vocabulary, the best way to do that is through reading. Um, you know, it, it is proven in, in numerous studies that reading is the greatest way to improve your vocabulary. At the moment, in this current climate, and you know, many of you will have more time on your hands than ever. Um, I really do urge you to spend some time each day reading. You know, it can be as little as 20 minutes a day. Try and schedule it in, make it a habit. Make it either the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning. Personally, I couldn't do that because I'm, I'm always ready for my breakfast. So I always make sure I do 20 minutes um, before bed at night. And if you schedule it into your day, and you know make it uh, you know something you have to do it will become a habit just like brushing your teeth you know you wake up every day you brush your teeth because you're used to doing it every day and hopefully not only will it become a habit that you'll do because you you know it'll help you improve but you will really really enjoy it and it will also um help to develop your vocabulary if you stuck on any titles or any books to read just contact your english teacher believe me they'll bite your hand off to, to give you some recommendations. Okay. Right, so the next thing we're going to look at is vocabulary to trigger emotions. So linking your vocabulary choices to the mood and atmosphere of your story. We've talked all the way throughout the, the previous lessons about how important this is. What do you want your reader to feel by the end of your story? You know, when you introduce that character, do you want them to be disgusted? Do you want them to feel proud? Um, whatever that overriding emotion is, you need to be using your vocabulary to create it. So um, in the first column, you'll see that there are a list of words. And I want you to try and sort those words into the following boxes. So um, disgust, fear and pride. So, you know, which of those words might make you feel disgust, for example, towards a character? And um, there is another box at the end for an emotion of your choice, which I challenge you to try and do that as well. And the words, I will read through them because there are some quite big words there. And um, again, if there's any you're not sure about, please look them up. Fixated, neurotic, engrossed, vanity, narcissistic, conceited, apprehension, angst, abhorrent, despondent, dejected and exquisite. All right, so for example, let's say I'm going to go with um, disgust. We may as well do that one, it's the first one on there. So which of those words might initially jump out? Right, well the first one, without even having to think about it for me, abhorrent. So if we're saying someone's an abhorrent, you know, we would uh, be disgusted with them. Okay, and then work your way through the words and see which box you would put them in. Um, okay, so if you pause the video and work your way through that activity, please do look up any words you're not sure of. And then let's get ready for lesson two. So that's lesson one done. And your second lesson is to explore using a range of vocabulary in your own writing. So there's been lots of me talking at you there and you doing little activities, but you're going to get a chance to use some of that vocab now. Right. So quick reminder about that mark scheme. Um, I mainly put this in again for anyone who's not doing the lessons at the same time. And it just talks you through what the the mark scheme is asking for and i've targeted these here at bronze silver and gold so if you're doing bronze today you know that's kind of where you're working four and five if you're going for the silver you're trying to push yourself more for the seven and then the gold is the eight and the nine okay so just like we did last time there are a selection of words that you need to try and write a definition for or an example. And if you don't know the others, please look them up. 
Okay, so um, just go through the pronunciation of these words. I would definitely say pronunciation isn't my strength, but I'm going to do it in my northern accent for you. So the first one, truculent, monstrous, formidable, colossal, frigorific, gargantuan, melancholy, which we actually had in that last round, so everyone should know that, and arduous. So pause your screen now, have a look for any of those words you're not sure of, and see if you can write any definitions. Okay, and these are um, the definitions here. So truculent would be fierce, cruel, brutal. If something was described as monstrous, we would imagine it to be frightening or hideous. Uh, formidable, causing fear or dread. Formidable can actually be um, quite a positive word as well. It's quite an interesting word because although it causes fear or dread in someone, it can be seen as quite a positive thing to be formidable. So that's something to bear in mind. Colossal is huge. Frigorific, which is a really, really old word. I'd be amazed if you, man if you knew that one. I'd be very, very impressed. And it's causing intense cold. So a good one if you're maybe talking about um, weather um, in your description. Uh, gargantuan, um, huge, melancholy, as we've said, depressing and arduous. If, if a task is, arduous, um, is very difficult, we would often describe it as arduous. Okay, so what I want you to do now is we're thinking about, there's always going to be, you know, if you look in a thesaurus, loads of different options. And I remember when I was a student, the thing I found the hardest was, well, which word would work best? And sometimes it is a case of, you know, trying out a couple of words to decide which one is going to fit the best. So in this table, you'll see there is a missing word in each sentence and then three different options for which word um, will work best. I'll talk you through the first one and we will do that together. And then I'll ask you to have a go at the final four alone. So the something cold snapped at his bare ankles and pinched at his frail cheeks. Right. So we've got three options, all of which would fit. Um, so the icy cold, the monstrous cold or the bitter cold. Now, which one would you choose? Now, if that was me looking at that, because it talks about it pinching him and his cheeks being quite frail, uh, um, and the fact that his ankles are bare, it almost sounds quite painful. Um, however, I would, I'm not sure I would go as far as saying it sounds monstrous, but I think either of those two words could work, monstrous or bitter. But for me, I think I'd be going um, for that bitter cold, because if we think of someone as bitter, you know, as a person, they're usually quite snappy and um you know quite cruel um, and quite miserable really and that that is the one that I personally would feel would work there I think you could get away with monstrous and, and icy works but it's just not as good as the other two so working your way through now the I want you to pause the video have a go at those four sentences and then we will go through the answers in a moment Okay, so hopefully you've done that. Well done. Let's look at number two. The something sounds of her glum music could be heard pouring from underneath her closed door. Right, so we've got uh, the melancholy sounds, the melodic sounds, or the reverberating sounds. Now, her music is glum. So for me, the answer there has to be melancholy. That sound, that, uh, that idea of it being quite miserable, quite depressing, um, even the fact that it's pouring from underneath the, the door sounds quite slow. Um, so I would definitely go for that choice there. Hopefully you did too. The next one, his something nature was well known to all who feared him. Are you going to go for benevolent, sadistic or easygoing? OK, right. Well, straight away, easygoing. Well, people aren't going to fear someone who's easygoing. So we can strike that one off. That wouldn't work. Benevolent. Can you remember what that means? OK, if you can't look back at your notes again, that wouldn't work there, would it? So the one that you should have chosen there would be sadistic. Next one. 
something, the procession, trooped through the desolate streets. Right, so desolate, um, desolate means that they're practically em empty. So I can't imagine that the, the procession is going to be going um, passionately or excitedly. So the, the choice I would go for there is solemnly um, creating up this, you know, this feeling of quite, quite sad, really. And then the last one, his jewellery was blank. A simple signet ring and delicate gold chain caressed his neck. So we're talking about a simple ring there and a delicate chain. So I would not use the word extravagant and I would not use the word lavish, which would mean that this, the second option would be the best fit there. This idea of it being fairly modest um, and not too in your face. So hopefully you did okay with that. Okay, and then the task that I need you to do, which for some reason the pictures aren't showing here on Zoom, um, but they will show on your ePraise PowerPoint that has been uploaded for you. But the pictures are of a campsite, a marketplace and an empty pier. And this is your challenge. So bronze, I want you to choose a range of words based on your image and write me a paragraph of description based on that image. Silver, I want you to choose an extensive range of vocabulary and I want you to write me two paragraphs and gold, please do challenge yourself here um, and try and use some extensive, um, an extensive range of ambitious words to describe the image and I'd like three paragraphs. Um, that needs to be submitted to your classroom teacher who will be able to mark it and give you some feedback. Um, and really, you know, spend some time over your word choice as you're doing this. Have a thesaurus near you or have your computer open and, you know, be looking. I don't know if you, I'm sure you know this, but when you're on Word, for example, if you left click, um, it will bring you a list of synonyms for each word. So think about the choices. If you don't understand what one of them, one of them means, don't use it. You look it up first, make sure it's going to fit. Um, but please take some time um, on this and we will look forward to reading them. Okay, I hope you are all okay and hopefully see you soon. Bye.